Uh, my name's uh, Jeff Ward, I'm from the University of Essex, and today I'm going to give you a talk about uh, uh, well, trying to integrate uh, two uh, short-term memory tasks, free recall and serial recall. And in today's talk, I'm going to be particularly interested in looking at transposition error gradients in serial recall. And my claim uh, in the summary is that can the free recall type output order actually explain serial recall output orders? So here's the overview. I'm going to introduce you to two uh, short-term memory tasks, immediate free recall and immediate serial recall. I'm going to claim uh, that they're historically, they, these have been rather separate, perhaps surprisingly so. Different theories explain free recall and serial recall, at least classically. But I want to claim that there's a need for theoretical unification. Uh, I'm going to use historical data from our lab to show that the two tasks are encoded similarly, similarly affected by different variables. And when you equate for the list length and the scoring system, the two tasks are more similar uh, than different. Here's the new stuff in section D. Uh, what I want to do is I want to reanalyze some data, some historic data, looking at start sequences and end sequences. And I want to show that when you replot uh, known data sets by start sequences and end sequences, serial and free recall really do look similar. And not only that, but when you uh, look at uh, start and end sequences, you can uh, try and explain error transposition gradients in serial recall and summary conclusions. So immediate free recall and immediate serial recall. These are two widely used and highly influential memory tasks. They share similar methods. In both tasks, you're presenting participants with lists of items one at a time, maybe in the center of the screen, and participants' task is always to try and remember as many of these items as possible. In free recall, Participants are free to record in any order they like. And in serial recall, participants must try to record in exactly the same order as they were presented. Now, the two tasks share a common theoretical heritage. You probably first encountered these in a lecture on short-term memory. Both have a classic signature, if you like, of a limited capacity short-term memory. Also, it's claimed. When you ask people to perform free recall, people are really good at remembering the last few items in the list the recency effect in immediate free recall. And these last items are thought to be directly output from some kind of short-term memory. Whereas in serial recall, the memory span in serial recall is a classic signature of a limited capacity short-term memory. So here's free recall. Uh, remember, you can record in any order you like, and it's difficult to plot serial position curves. No, not position, sorry about that. Serial position curves. Uh, so you're presenting participants maybe with a slightly longer list, maybe up to say 12 items in the list in this example, but normally it's 10, 20, 30, even 40 items in the list. It's not uncommon for free recall. And here you plot proportion correct with free recall scoring. You score an item as correct if you say it at any point in recall. You can see that there's a large advantage at the end of the list. This is a recency effect and a smaller advantage at the beginning of the list. This is a primacy effect. By contrast, in this immediate serial recall, you typically use a much shorter length and your task is to recall in the same order. Now you have a extended primacy, so you score by serial recall scoring. You've got to get the item in the correct order. So the first item has to be said first. The second item has to be said in the second output position. And you can see that both tasks are primacy and recency. But recency dominates in free recall, large recency in red there, but primacy dominates in serial recall. Now historically, free recall and serial recall have often been explained by very different theories. And here's a list I drew up in a, in a paper in 2010. All these theories explain serial recall, so if your theory isn't there, sorry, you can add it where necessary. And all these theories explain free recall. But the theories there which explain serial recall don't say much about free recall, and vice versa, the theories about free recall don't say much about serial recall. Now, why is that? Uh, and many people just don't understand why there are separate theories. One reason I, I put forward is because of a limit, the nature of a limited capacity short-term memory. So when Bad and Hitch in 1974 first started looking at working memory, uh, they were interested in whether a concurrent digit load of say six digits, trying to remember them in the, in the same order, from six digits for immediate serial call, whether that would interfere with your ability to learn lists of words. And in one of the experiments, they gave people free recall lists of 16 words for free recall, and they either had a control condition, or they asked people at the same time to remember three or six digits concurrently, for immediate serial recall. I think what you can see in this graph here is that if you look 
at the last items in this for free recalls, so this is performance on free recall, you can see there's a strong recency effect in immediate free recall. And that recency effect in, a, in free recall is not really affected by a six digit concurrent load. And Badley and Hitch replicated this several times, and indeed my lab has replicated this finding too. There's not much of a trade off between immediate serial recall and the recency effect in free recall. And in this long quote, which I won't ask you to read, but hopefully you'll take my word for it, Badley says, it is suggested that working memory, which in other respects can be regarded as a modified short term memory, does not provide the basis for recency. So Badley doesn't explain recency effects in free recall, and that's a reason for the serial recordists to distance themselves from free recall. And in fact, they have to say this if you want the same limited capacity short term memory. If you believe in a limited capacity short term memory, which explains both the recency effect in free recall and performance in immediate serial recall, then you have difficulty explaining this lack of trade off between two uh, signatures, which are uh, thought of as uh, reflecting a limited capacity short term store. So that's one reason. A second reason is Badley was, was, was inspired to do this work because he noticed that in immediate serial it was affected by all kinds of speech-based variables. The phonological similarity of, uh, 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 of a list, how long the words were on a list, whether you prevent people from uh, rehearsing through articulatory suppression or irrelevant speech. These are all phonological loop variables, uh, speech-based variables, and they affect immediate serial but badly pointed out they didn't really affect the recency effect in free recall, suggesting that serial recall and recency are rather different. Um, a third reason is that, well, probably more common and more pragmatic for most computational modelers these days, is the theorists of serial recall are all about explaining primacy effect. Why do we do so well at remembering the first item in a list in the correct order? Whereas theorists in free recall are all uh, based on trying to explain uh, the characteristic recency effects. And perhaps with computational modeling, in particular, which makes us, our, our representation of serial order uh, uh, really explicit, it's not very really easy to have a model which explains why primacy is so good, at the same time as explaining a model which explains why recency is so good. Maybe there's a kind of pragmatic primacy and recency effects here. But I want to argue that there is a need for theoretical unification. I want to say these two tasks are encoded in similar ways, are actually affected similarly by different variables, and they are really similar when you encode them by the same list lengths and scoring systems. So I'm going to take you through some historic data to, to prove these points, uh, uh, or to argue these points. In Batara, Ward and Tan, we had three groups of participants. They all, all participants were studied eight item lists for immediate recall. One group always had eight item lists, lists of words, and we're told you're always going to do serial recall. And indeed, they always perform serial recall. A second group always performed free recall. And a third group were post queued These people again saw eight item lists, but only at the end of the list did they know whether to perform free recall or serial recall. And the question was, in this third post queued group, they had to necessarily, these items had to be encoded in the same way. They didn't know which type of test they'd have. But could they retrieve the items in a serial like way in the post queued serial recall and retrieve in a free recall like way in a post queued free recall? And how similar would the pre queued be with to the, to, to the post queued? So here's the data from serial recall. The people who are always told to do a serial recall are the black uh, triangles, the field triangles. Large primacy effects here when you plot the data by uh, proportion correct with serial recall scoring, first item first, second item second, and so on. Large extended primacy effects, virtually no recency here. But the, of, of interest is that the people who are told that they are only at test to perform serial recall, they're doing pretty well here. They're retrieving with a, with a similar kind of pattern in the post-queued ISR is very similar to the ISR pre-queued. And in free recall, a rather different characteristic serial position curve, much more recency, less primacy here, a kind of U-shaped curve here. And again, the post-queued free recall people look just like the pre-queued free recall people, very, very similar uh, encoding. So I want to claim that free recall and serial recall are encoded very, very similarly. And there's a change in retrieval. When you're told to do serial recall, you're able to start at the start and go forwards. And when you're told to, you're allowed to do free recall, you have a preference to start with the last items and output them first before trying to go, go back and get the, the, the start items. They're also affected, the two tasks are affected similarly by uh, similar variables. Uh, so here we have a number of variables, phonological similarity effects, word length effects, articulatory expression, 
Uh, there's a kind of speech-based variables, another kind of free recall type variables, presentation rate, temporal isolation effects and modality. They're very, very similar. When you control for the list length and the scoring systems, actually the performance on the two tasks uh, are similarly affected by these variables. Just one example here, uh, looking at uh, word length. Here's a classic word length effect in immediate serial call. If you're asking people to remember lists of short words, uh, performance is really good. Medium words, it's a bit worse. Um, long words, people pretty, find that pretty tough for immediate serial call. Same kind of lists of words for free recall, and you get the same kind of effect. The overall shape of the curve is very different, much more U-shaped in, in free recall, much more of a um, primacy effect in serial recall. Uh, but look, notice that badly was quite right. You don't really have a big, strong effect of phonological loop variables at the end of the list. In free recall, the recency effect isn't really affected by this, but, but it's not really affected in the recency bit of the immediate serial call either. So the two tasks affect similarly, but here's the main point, the list length and scoring system. And we need to go to, to Ward's Tanner Grant lesson for this. Uh, we presented participants a list of words between 1 and 15. Uh, and the list, could, uh, list of words for free recall between 1 and 15 words, the list could stop at any time. It was completely randomized list length, completely unpredictable. Let's have a look at the overall serial position curves. Uh, the list of between 1 and 15 words. Here you go, for a list of one, uh, one word, uh, that's pretty well remembered. So on this axis is the proportion correct. On this axis is the serial position. We've got 15 different lines reflecting 15 different list lengths. This is your performance of performing recall on, on one item list and those University of Ethics students there, they're pretty good. Not perfect though, frustratingly, 99% something like that. Two item lists, three item lists, four item lists, five item lists. But by the time you get to about six or seven item lists, a bow-shaped serial position curve is opening up. And by the time you get to a more characteristic list length of, of 10, 12, 15 items, you can see its extended recency with only a small amount of, of primacy. So you, you might wonder why I'm focusing on this. But if we now look to see which word do you start with, so this is the data for all the items in the list, but if we now concentrate on what is the starting point, which words you start with, and we look at the probability of first recall. So th this plots the serial position again on this axis, but now this is plotting, uh, like if you like, a serial position curve of just the first word recalled. And you can see, that participants either start with the first item or they start with one of the last four. And for short lists, you start with the first item, and for longer lists, you start with one of the last four items. So you output either the first item first or one of the last four items first. And when you replot this same data by, with list length now on, on the uh, uh, x axis and look at the probability of first record here. This is basically just plotting that if you've got a short list, you tend to start at the start, but if you've got a long list, you tend to start at the end. And the important thing is that where you start in free recall has a massive effect on the rest of the serial position curve. If you start at the start, then you go on and recall other primacy items. This is plotted with serial recall scoring to show that uh, if, uh, with a four item list, actually you you're, you're have a tendency to, to recall in forwards order. Whereas if you start at the end of the list, then you have, have a, this is recency justified, you recall other recency items and have a greatly reduced primacy effect. Put another way, uh, for short lists, you tend to recall in a serial recall-like manner. So if I said to you, recall this list in any order you like, hats, mouse, tea, stairs, you might find that you'd have a tendency to say hats, mouse, tea, stairs. You might have a tendency to recall in forward serial order. And here's the data I'm going to reanalyze today with some Grenfell Lesson and Award data. Here's the five item lists, serial recall. Here's a, a 15 item list for free recall showing characteristic primacy and recency here. But actually, Grenfell Lesson and Award combined Ward Tan and Grenfell Lesson and Tara Tau. We had three groups one group always did free recall, one group always did serial recall, one group was post queued we varied the list lengths, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, or 15 words. Here we go. Uh, that's the five items for free, serial recall and 15 items for free recall, but looks very different. You might see you need different theories to explain these two types of findings. But if we add all the list lengths, compare the same range of list lengths, the serial position curves will look a little bit more similar. If we use the same scoring system, so we say, let's score them both with free recall scoring, 
Well, now they really do look quite similar. And if we compare the pre queues with the post queue, that's the, that's the, uh, sorry, that's, that's the, it's, oops, it's, that's the pre queues condition, serial call with serial call scoring and free recall with free recall scoring. And that's the post queue. Do I toggle between them? There are some differences, but actually it suggests that in the post queue condition, where you're including it in the same way in the two tasks, you're getting much more extended recency over here and much more primacy over here. So theoretical integration between these two tasks, is it possible? Well, the, the, the data so far suggests that in free recall at least, uh, there seems to be privileged access to the first item. And if you start at the first item, you'll go in a forward order. So the tendency to start at the start decreases with this length. And I want to say it, that it, the chances of starting with zero position one increases with intent. If you know there's going to be a test, uh, or you decide to rehearse it, or you have some cognitive control, you decide as a retrieval strategy to go for the first item, you have a greater chance of going for the first item. But if you, go, if you access the first item, you'll continue in a forward order. By contrast, uh, you have an, a, another privileged access is the last four items. You uh, can access these much more readily than serial position one. Again, it, wherever you, 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 you access the, but one of the last four items, there's a tendency to go in a forward order. Very easy access to the end of the list, less affected by intent or cognitive control or rehearsal. So if you start with one of the last four items, you're going to recall uh, an end sequence. And that made me think, well, let's reanalyze some of that data we've just been playing around with uh, in, a, in a way which hasn't been done before. Suppose we look at lists lengths of different lengths, like an eight item list here, or a four item list here, or a 15 item list here. And here are some possible recalls. I've just made these up, but they're, they're kind of possible. Maybe if you were to score the output orders by end sequences, so these are sequences terminating with the last item, or start sequences, these are sequences which initiate with, with the first item, A, and continue. What happens, what do the, the curves look like? Uh, from, from Graham Flats and, and Ward when you analyze the data by start and end sequences? And the answer is the data looks surprisingly similar. These are the pre queued free recall, the post queued free recall, the pre queued serial recall, the, the, the post queued serial recall. Really, it looks, these curves look really, really similar. In each case, participants remember something of the start of the list in a start sequence and something of the end of the list in an end sequence. And that made me think well, how far could you go? With start sequences and end sequences. Um, let's um, one area. So I'm, I'm on sabbatical this year. I'm trying to think of a way of combining and integrating free recall and serial recall. And I'm thinking, well, one potentially um, one, one potential source of, of difficulty for integrating free recall and serial recall are error transposition gradients. Error transposition gradients and serial recall suggest that each item in a list is you know something of the, of the serial order position of that item. Here is an error transposition gradient in, in serial call as, as a demonstration. This is data from Austin and Dennis in 2015. They had like 100 participants each tested with 60 odd trials of data. And what it shows is the, the, the frequency with which you output serial position one in the first position, or the serial position two in output position two, or serial position three in output position three. And you can see that you get this primacy effect of correct responses. But what it also shows is that when you make a mistake, when you say output pos a serial position four and you don't say it in output position four, you have a higher tendency to say it in output position three than output position two or one. In fact, these error transposition gradients are quite hard to spot if you keep in all the correct responses. If you strip away the correct responses and just look at the errors, you, and so I've, I've taken away all of these correct responses and just plotted the data as proportion of errors, you can see that when the, when the serial position six, when you don't say serial position six, you have a high tendency to say it in alpha position five, better than four, than three, than two. You can see that, the, that these, these curves uh, are, 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 are kind of go up to a peak around where their true position. You have this locality constraint. And this could be a problem for free recall. This suggests that people know something about the output position of all the items, you might think. Uh, and that isn't normally considered to be the case in free recall. We don't think we have that kind of fidelity in free recall. But is there a way of explaining 
serial recall transposition gradient, it's using free recall outputs. And here's the tentative hypothesis. Suppose you have a start sequence and an end sequence. And then if you remember anything in any the other items, they're just the other items and you randomly output them in the middle. If so, could it be the case that these other items, which you don't know any order information at all, are just allocated a position, which because of the constraints of start sequences and end sequences, ends up in an error transposition gradient. So let's just explain. Here are some possible outputs from the outputs, especially presenting with A, B, C, D, E, F, G, no, A, B, C, D, E, F. And here are some recalled sequences. You can say, say, well, here are some start sequences and here are some end sequences. And here are some other items which you've remembered, but you don't know anything about the random order. Suppose what we do is we take the Austin and Dennis data and we look for start sequences and record those and look for end sequences and we look to see any other items which are recalled and then we just randomly order those items. What kind of error gradients do we get? So what, we, what we'll take is Austin and Dennis's data sets. They've got uh, some people doing serial call, some people doing reconstruction of order, serial call and layout now a blank or closed serial order. So these are the serial order uh, with the same words on every trial. Here's their immediate serial call performance, quite a bit of difference between these different groups. Uh, with free recall performance. Um, yeah, still some difference between these groups. Uh, but when you start end sequence scoring, well, maybe you get a bit of privacy and recency emerging here. So this is new for this, start end sequence scoring. But here's what's really important. Here, uh, here is the error gradient uh, for, um, I can't see what it is because <laughs> Zoom blocks that out for me. And that's the, the open serial recall scoring. So on the left-hand side is we have Austin Dennis's data. And on the right hand side has, has what happens when you randomly or, or, or it and randomly allocate the guesses. You have the start sequences and the end sequences and you randomly allocate the guesses and you get these very, very similar patterns of data. And this is true for all four conditions of Austin Dennis. No matter which condition you have, you always get these. This is the observed data on the left. This is the kind of, if you like, uh, estimated uh, data on the right, you will get the same pattern. And it's quite hard to see because it's dominated by correct responses. So if we look at the um, just, just the errors here, this is, these are observed data for two of the conditions here. And now this is just random. These items, I'm, I say, we know nothing about the order of these. We just allocate them randomly. And yet just look at the way they fall out. These are constrained by what we know and we're just distributing these randomly in the, in the gaps between what we know about the start and the end. And for all four conditions, these are known data, but look what happens over here for these randomly allocated errors. They look really similar. So I, I, my argument is that with free recall outputs, where we have a start sequence and end sequence, we can just guess the order of the rest and these error transposition gradients fall out. So there is a need for unification for the two tasks. I've shown similar encoding, similar effects of different variables, and similar effects when this length and scoring systems are the same. Both tasks generate a start sequence and end sequence. This is a new, new, new analysis. And we can use these start sequences and end sequences, and because they are known and variable in length, when you randomly allocate, allocate the serial position of any other item you remember, they will naturally generate error transposition gradients. So we can consider free recall explanations to explain serial recall phenomena. We don't have to have theory of free recall, which says that each item is, uh, um, is associated with, with some kind of um, list marker or output position. We don't need item position markers, or we don't even need a primacy gradient to explain error transposition gradients. We just need start sequences and end sequences. If you randomly allocate the items in the middle, we get perfectly acceptable error transposition gradients. And I'll, 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 I'll stop there. Thank you. All right, great, thank you. So we have about seven minutes for Q&A. So please go ahead. So Maverick has a question. Oh, no, sorry, I was just clapping. <laughs> yeah, I keep mistaking that. Uh, so. Oh, there is a raise hand now, Ben. Hi. 
Thank you. Uh, really, really interesting uh, data and talk. So you, in, regarding your conclusion, so you said that you can explain serial recall with a free recall model that doesn't assume any positional markers, right? Uh, you, you do, well, it, has to, it has to assume that you have a, a, a start position marker. Just, just the start, just the initial. Okay, so yeah, that, that's my question about the start and the end sequences. So uh, you still somehow have to represent the order of the start and end sequences, right? There, uh, you, you said there are three to four items sometimes, uh, and in order to recall those in the uh, correct uh, order, you still have to assume some kind of either uh, positional marker or chaining or some other mechanism. Uh, or well, maybe I misunderstood. Uh, no, no, no. It's it's it, it's true. So um, the so so my, my gut reaction, if I deal with the end sequences first, I think that what you do is you perform just free recall, just the that's just the recency effect in free recall for both the prime for both serial recall and free recall. I think it's just the recency effect in free recall, and I don't know that participants are are, are truly trying to remember the items in order. It's just the order in which they are output and they just, just like recency, so you look at the probability of first recall, you're most, most likely just to start with the last item. Mm -hmm. You just know that's the last item. Sometimes you generate the, what, the, the penultimate item, and if you do, then you go on to recall the next item. So is that really knowing about the serial position or are you just, um, are you just opening your mind and if you like uh, forming a recency-based type uh, retrieval? Whichever word comes to your mind, you then say that item, or if I think of that's the start, the end item, and then you can naturally carry, or carry forward through a kind of lag plus one type uh, mechanism. And when you stop, you think, oh, I've got to the end of the list. So that, that's, that, that, that's a very unscientific way, maybe, of, of thinking about this recency effect. Uh, but I don't know that participants need to think I'm recalling n minus two here, or I'm recalling n minus one here. But they, they just come with an item which comes to mind and they're naturally able to go forwards. In terms of the start, I think that there is a serial position one kind of like, there must be some context cue for the start of the list. Um, and that start of the list, um, is, I think is under voluntary control and probably everyone tries to remember it in a, in a list of this type. But as the list length increases, there comes to a point where on some of the occasions they just, just forget how frustrating for them. They, they, they just don't remember the start of the list. But I don't think they, they have a marker for, for item two or item three or a gradient necessarily. But again, they start at the start of the list and then mm, there is a forward order continuation and they can recall the second item and the third item and the fourth item it, with, with less, le, le, less, lesser uh, you know, kind of cumulative order. So I don't, don't think there is necessarily a traditional item position marker or a traditional privacy gradient. More one item might lead to another. So it could be something like a context dependent chain, you know, kind of like item dependent moving along or context context. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of agnostic with respect to those mechanisms, maybe it's a short answer, um, but I, I don't think it needs to be quite as complicated machinery or it doesn't necessitate that, I don't think, quite as complicated machinery as a traditionally built in to do serial call uh, theories. Okay. We have Martin. Yes, thank you. Uh, it was a really interesting uh, talk and uh, nice what you do with the data. You do those, those reanalyses and uh, testing predictions. I have a, um, a question that, that might just reflect my own ignorance. I recall having seen these such figures long, long, long time ago in talks of Kahana. So my question is something that you're alluding to. Doesn't TCM do a pretty good job um, uh, modeling uh, such patterns in both serial recall and uh, um, uh, free recall? Um, I don't think that's quite true. So yes, um, Mike Kahan has classically started, started as free recall. Um, and yeah, definitely they can explain serial, serial position curves. They normally concentrate, so models like TCM and CMR, they, they actually have difficulty in uh, explaining why you should initiate recall of a shortlist with the first item. So those theories are very, very recency based. You, the, the, you start your recall with the, with, with the end of list context and the most similar items to the end of the list 
will be other end of list items. So they say that the probability of us recording, they almost always look at 10, 12, 15, 20 item lists. They're really good at giving you that recency with a small amount of privacy for the first recall, um, but they don't really capture this idea that on a short list, you initiate the call with the first item. So yeah, if they, if, if, if they could explain that, why you initiate recall with the first item, then you know, something like TCM might be able to do a good job. And that's maybe kind of what, what I'm getting at, that you might need some access to the serial position one and some recency. And if you could guarantee both and had a kind of forward order uh, mechanism like like as in TCM or CMR, yeah, you might you, you might stand a reasonable chance, but I don't think they've ever looked at transposition gradients uh, other than in kind of spin list data and long list data. And my understanding is that when people like uh, Adam, Adam Moss, whose data I've been looking at, and Farrell and Hurlstone have looked at this, uh, there um, there is a difference in the spin list data and the long list serial learning data in terms of the kind of prior list intrusions and the error transposition gradients, yeah, the kind of fill-in errors and infill errors. Um, whereas I, actually, I think this start-end sequence can say something about those. But um, yeah, it's a bit, you know, I'm still working through those analyses now, uh, but, but I'm, I'm fairly confident that uh, the, 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 analyzing the data by start sequences and end sequences will actually speak to uh, the serial position of transposition gradients, so the, um, Seal position uh, effects of uh, prior list intrusions, um, yeah, and, and these and these error gradients too. So yeah, uh, so the, the, definitely TCM is a kind of I, 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 a theory I know quite well and have it have in the back of my head, uh, but it doesn't explain for short list why you choose the start of the start. All right, great. Uh, thanks a lot for that talk, Jeff.